Hey, good day there, everybody. This is Joe. Well, I'm a day late, hopefully not a dollar short. It's a beautiful morning out here in Albuquerque, and I'm sitting out on the front porch. I was going to do a video yesterday, and I got sidetracked, and that's a whole other story in itself. My wife had this Easter bunny, little straw kind of a thing, sitting on the kitchen table for a while, and I was looking at it the other day thinking, you know, that's kind of interesting looking. That would make a good black and white photo. And that's a good opportunity to shoot some paper negatives and a large format camera. And I thought, oh, I could make a still life, maybe. That would be fun. And so um, I set up a still life yesterday in the garage. And then I decided, OK, I'm, I'm, before I can go any further, I need to find my light meter and figure out what my exposure is going to be. And I couldn't find my light meter. And I essentially rat holed myself the rest of the whole day yesterday looking for this silly light meter. I have an older meter that used to work fine. I've had it repaired several times, but I don't trust it. My new meter, because it's new and the readings are consistent, I do trust it. Couldn't find it. Maybe about 11.30 last night, 11.15, right before I went to bed, I found the meter. So this morning, I hope to complete this project and get it posted for you. We're going to do a large format still life on paper negatives. Stay tuned. So how accurate is this old meter against the new one? Well, let's try and find out. I have my old Gossen set to ISO 100. I have the new Siconic set to ISO 100. They're both on reflective metering mode. And uh, let's take a metering against the wall here. Okay, zero the needle on the Gaussian. And it's reading like F11 just under 125th of a second. So about F11 at 100, 100th of a second. And the new meter is reading F11.2 at a 15th of a second. 100th of a second, 15th of a second. Yeah, I don't think this one is working. So when I was thinking about this opportunity to do this uh, still life on paper negatives, I was kind of thinking, what lens and what camera would I use? And I think the first choice I really jumped for was the speed graphic. And the reason why is, you know, I have two conventional large format lenses. They're both good lenses, but one of the lenses I've had a lot of fun doing still lifes with over the years is a makeshift lens, and I thought it would be a good chance to revisit makeshift lenses. And uh, this is the lens. It is a mounted to a piece of model aircraft plywood, and it is the front element out of a Bushnell 7x50 binocular. I notice a lot of new binoculars, the way they're built, you can't really easily unthread the optics, but this is a two element lens. It is 50 millimeter in diameter and it has a focal length at infinity, a focal length about 150 millimeters, roughly six inch focal length. So if you run this lens wide open, you're talking about F3 or so, but you're gonna have a lot of distortion around the edge of the image. And so I like to stop this lens down whenever I can. And I've uh, made various f-stops over the years for this lens. This is about a three millimeter aperture, so that makes it f-50. And this one is a little piece of brass that's been darkened with uh, gaffer's tape. I soldered a brass flange to it, and it fits around the rear threads inside the lens like that. I think the one that I used a lot was a 20 millimeter aperture, which gave it about um, f-7.5, I think at infinity. I also have a pinhole plate, a piece of masonite with a little brass pinhole. I actually have two pinholes available for it. The one that's currently in here is a 0.33 millimeter. I also have a 0.2 millimeter pinhole that I can stick in the camera. But for today, I think I'm going to use a refractive lens, makeshift lens, binocular lens. Well, now the challenge, though, of using a makeshift lens like this is that this lens doesn't have a shutter. So that presents a problem. However, the speed graphic has its own shutter. The camera body has its own shutter. It is a curtain shutter. There's an upper and a lower curtain, and 
But because the speed graphic has its own curtain shutter, you can use any kind of lens, any kind of refractive lens up front. It doesn't have to be a large format lens with an integral shutter on the lens. So that's cool. Uh, as for how accurate the shutter is, it's probably not greatly accurate considering the age of the camera. However, what's most important is if it's consistent. If I'm using the same settings, it'll be a consistent speed even if that speed isn't correct according to the little chart up here. But I'm going to do a series of tests. So the way this is going to work is I'm going to make a meter reading right here of my scene. I'm going to make set my shutter to the closest setting to what I think it should be. I'm going to make a test exposure. I'm going to process the paper negative and look at my results, evaluate it. Is it overexposed or underexposed? And I'll compensate from there, give it more or less exposure. Uh, the other possibility now we have, though, when you're using makeshift lenses with still lifes is you could decide if you illuminate the subject properly you may not need to worry about a shutter. In other words, if you can get the shutter speed above a second, like two seconds at least, so it, you can use a lens cap, 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, and you want it to be at least two seconds so that you can time that exposure accurately and repeatedly. You can't really easily time a one second exposure, you know, like 1, 1,000. If you're a little bit off, that little error makes a huge percentage of the total exposure. But if you do like a 2 or a 4 second exposure, that little error is much less important to the overall effect. And this is the little setting I made up on the workbench here. Our backdrop is, of course, bubble wrap taped to my cabinets here and just various things. This is the bunny in question, a little kind of a straw bunny and just some rather humorous little elements, a can of beans and a macaroni and cheese box from Trader Joe's and a cigar box and some eggs and stuff. Okay, so I fashioned a, out of craft paper a 20 millimeter aperture. So you just want to eyeball this and center it as best you can. That looks pretty close. Okay, let's go put it in the camera and see what it looks like. And as is true with all view cameras, the image is upside down and also it gets dimmer as you stop it down. But I can definitely see that along the edges of the image, see our cigar box is now sharper than it was before. But we still have nice uh, selective focus in here. So. I think this 20 millimeter aperture is going to work good. That's at infinity focus, that would be f7.5. But of course, the bellows is drawn out a little bit more. So we're going to have to figure out what that is by calculating it. Ad hoc measurement from the center of the lens to the film plane is about 220 millimeters. So 220 divided by 20 is f11. So on my meter, I need to first change the ISO to what I think the working ISO of my paper is. And I usually rate it at about ISO 12. So I'm going to use a reflective reading and meter the scene just under the existing lights here. And if I adjust the f-stop up to f11, it's going to be about 8 seconds exposure. So I can just use a lens cap shutter not the mechanical shutter on the camera. However, I think I'm going to add some additional lighting to the left side of the image with this uh, LED panel. And I can not only adjust the intensity, but I can also adjust the color temperature. I'm going to run it up toward the blue end, which is where the paper is more sensitive, and then we'll re-meter the scene. Reflected re-meeting. Four seconds at f11. So we gained about a whole stop by using that light, which I think we'll go ahead and use. Okay, so I'm going to cut some uh, 4x5 sheets out of this uh, 8x10 of the Arista Ultra Grade 2 Semi-Matte RC paper. Load them in my sheet film holder. I'm going to start with two negatives to start with. We'll do our test exposure. We'll do one at ISO 12 and maybe go down to ISO 8 or something just to see uh, 
if there's any difference, maybe if my metering is correct or whatever, and then we'll process those two and see what we get. Okay, so since I had to cut the uh, 8x10 sheet into four pieces, I just went ahead and loaded two film holders. So I have four paper negatives preloaded, and I also pre-flashed my paper negatives using my pre-flashing light source and my little timer. I usually pre-flash for about three and a half seconds. So when I cut my paper, I first uh, cut the 10 inch side at the five inch mark here. So I set the edge of the paper here and I slice it to make two uh, eight by five pieces. And then I rotate the paper 90 degrees and I cut it to just below four inches, but not quite three and seven eighths, about three and 15 sixteenths roughly on the short side. And that helps uh, the paper negatives to slide into the film holder nicely along the rails without getting too tight. And so then I slice them that way and you end up with little slicings of paper, little trimmings that uh, you can use at a later date to test your fixer with to see if your fixer is active. If this little tint that shows up from being exposed to light, to room light, if that tint disappears when you stick it in the fixer, then it's uh, a good sign that it's still active. Okay, so what I want to do now, I have my f-stop on the lens, and I want to just finish the composition, making sure that I really have it where I want it. Okay, for a lens cap, I've made this little black paper and gaffer's tape light type cover just with a strip of paper made into a hoop to fit snugly over the lens barrel and then a disc of paper and then I just used a bunch of little strips of black gaffer's tape and that just fits over there so that's going to be my shutter. Okay we'll take our first film holder. Lens cap is on. Pull the dark slide. 1001, 1002, 1003, 1004. Alright, that was timed by hand. Could have used a stopwatch, but... Okay, I'm going to flip the film holder over to the B side. And pull the dark slide. And this time I'm going to give it about a six second exposure. I'm going to use my, wa my stopwatch here. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. Two test exposures at two different times. So now it's time to process the 4x5 paper and see what results are. And then we'll go and iteratively make any adjustments if we need to to get a good negative. Well, okay, so I have my film, my paper, loaded in this tank. This is a, this is a test print tank, a Jobo test print tank. It holds two prints. And I have my chemistry all poured up right here in little 100 milliliter plastic cups and my homemade roller base. And I'm going to go ahead and process these. It'll be about three minutes in the developer, two minutes in the fixer, and everything else, all the water steps and the stop bath will be about 30 seconds each. So it'll take a roughly nine, nine and a half minutes. Well, okay there, let's see what results we have. Let's see, I believe this was the first shot. That's pretty interesting. The shadow, the highlights are pretty dense. Almost overexposed even. But, uh, that's pretty cool. Let's take a look at the other one. See how the binoculars gives the lens stopped down, gives this interesting out of focus blurry effect to the edges and corners. Okay, so the developer that I used was a used batch of one plus three Arista paper developer that I mixed back in November of 2018. And so that's actually a lot richer of a concentration than I normally use, which might explain why the highlights were so dark. I'm going to dilute this uh, down to 1 plus 12 probably. I'm going to 1 to 4 dilute this. And I'm, that other film holder I loaded, I'm going to go ahead and 
take a couple test exposures. I think that one's probably the best one of the whole bunch. Well, I've been worrying about this corner of the grass. I haven't really started my sprinklers going yet this spring, but I think it's awful dry, so we're going to water the grass a little bit while we're rinsing our prints. Okay, so I'm going to, of the four negatives that we took, I'm going to take the last negative that was exposed at four seconds, but the dilution was only one-third the dilution of the first two. So I have it stuck down to this metal plate that I have some of these flat, flexible magnets on. And I have a camera mount above here that I do my tabletop shots, and I'm going to set my video camera to the still mode. And I'm going to have to actually elevate this a little bit closer to the lens because the reach of my zoom that I have on it doesn't quite fill the frame. So. I'm going to probably have it elevated here, take a shot, and then I'm going to transfer that file from my Panasonic Lumix camera to my iPhone, and I'm going to actually invert the image in the iPhone. Okay, so we're going to go to our photos, and this is the picture that we took with the Lumix camera and transferred to the iPhone here. So I want to go in and edit this photo. Hit edit, and I'm going to hit the cropping button in the upper left, and I'm going to crop in the picture. Uh, let's see, let's see, I can take it in a little bit there. Maybe we will just go ahead and take the uh, take the large format borders off of it, like that. Looks like the borders are pretty good. As far as the tones, they're not too bad either. We're going to go ahead and save that. Hit done in the upper left. Okay. It's still a negative image, however, so we have to invert it. We're going to invert this image, and first of all, we're going to go to our settings on our iPhone. We're going to go to General, to Accessibility tab, to Display Accommodations, and we're going to turn on Invert Colors in the upper tab, and Smart Invert. Okay. Now, we're going to hit the Home button, and we're going to go to our photos and select this photo that we just cropped. I'm going to rotate the phone and I'm going to get a full screen picture. And I'm going to take a screen grab. Screen grab is when you hold down the power button and toggle the home key. Okay, there is a screen grab that we have just taken. Now we're going to go back to our settings and turn off the smart invert and now when we go back to our photos we are going to have a positive image right there and I'm going to go ahead and edit that positive image I'm going to go to the third icon from the top left and hit light uh, I'm going to first look at increasing contrast so contrast so I'm looking at the shadow detail on the pot. It's getting a little darker, but I don't want to blow out the highlights anymore on the white cigar box to the right. So I'm going to leave the contrast about there. I'm going to select Brilliance and see what I can do there. Now that's better because it's increasing the contrast of the midtones, not so bad. And now we're going to increase contrast. Let's see if I can. And now. If I can select maybe exposure, I have to see here, experiment with it. Kind of like that looks kind of interesting. So I'm going to go ahead and just save that, hit done. And before we do so, that was the original, there is the crop. Okay, hit done. And there she is. All right. Well, I really liked this project. This is real satisfying for me to take a camera like the Speed Graphic, load up some photo paper in it, find a still life and use an improvised lens like a binocular lens and get this wonderful out of focus blurriness on the edge, but the center part of the image is still sharp enough to be well defined. You can see the subject matter. It's a lot of fun. And of course, there's a lot of hands-on experimenting, figuring out the right exposure and 
processing the paper, you know, with the right dilution of chemistry and the right temperature, all that affects the finished results. And so it's a lot of fun. It's very satisfying. And then having a little slick way to digitize the negative and invert it for at least posting on the internet or on these videos is real convenient. However, I would say the finished result of this project ultimately will be a contact print onto a piece of fiber-based black and white photo paper. That'll be the, the end result of that. I'm always wanting to encourage you guys to be creative, stay creative. I always say that or try to at the end of my videos. And this is the example. Some little idea sitting at the breakfast table last week looking at this little figure of a Easter bunny with straw and I like the texture of it and the light on it and I was thinking wow that would be an interesting subject matter for a still life. You know you got to follow those creative urges. Don't ignore them. Write them down. Follow that creative trail in your life. Well until next time you guys have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye.